All right, we're doing things a little differently this episode because um, it's Friday night and we have to pack for a last minute trip. We're going to one of my favorite places, New Mexico. And so I will record the LX3 video that you're about to watch tomorrow. But in the meantime, I need to know what we're packing. So the next camera will be... already know what I'm shooting for the next two weeks. As you just saw, I'm excited to reveal what that is because I've gotten a lot of requests for this camera to be reviewed. Um, so stick around for that. But until then, we will be reviewing the Panasonic Lumix LX3, which I've been shooting for the past two weeks. This is the Panasonic Lumix LX3. This is the Panasonic Lumix LX3. And I have yet another Panasonic LX3 coming in the mail. Now, why do I have three LX3s in my possession? We'll get to that. But first, let's start with a few specs. Um, this is a 2008 camera with a CCD sensor. It is 10 megapixels. It has a focal range of equivalent 24 to 60, f2 to 2.8. So, this Lumix, and I'm old enough to know when this came out or remember when this came out, and it was a very big deal. I really wanted this camera, but it was very expensive when it came out, and I did not purchase it. But I did spend one day shooting a friend's, and I was like, wow, this is a cool camera. Um, it was really well known for a couple of things. The fast lens, so this is 2008 earlier than the Olympus XC1, which came out in 2011 and which I just reviewed. But this came out prior to that and it was a huge deal to not only have an f2 to 2.8 lens, but it had a 24 millimeter to 60 millimeter focal range. A lot of cameras back in this time did not start that wide. They didn't really have the optical formulas to be able to do that and most of these compact zooms went from 35 on, but usually not as wide as 24. The other thing that it was really well known for is the fact that it was a Leica lens. I don't know if you're gonna read that, but it's a Leica lens. Um, so it's, I mean, it even says Summicron on here, fancy, but um, it's a really good lens. So that's really what it was famous for. It goes from ISO 80 to 6400, I mean, on paper. Um, and it has image stabilization. It had HD, or does have HD video at 20 frames, 24 frames per second, which was highly unusual at that time. And it has complete manual functionality. Um, you can turn the, the focus from manual to um, autofocus and to macro focus on the side. Uh, it has, you know, full control and manual on the top here. So really cool. Hold on. I'm, I'm got a little cough here. So of course I've got my Elsa cup to keep me warm. like to use in 2022 it's fun like it's a very very fun camera it has a proper grip on it um, the back is a little too small for my taste and the buttons are too small but overall it's a comfortable carry and I enjoy shooting it I love the multi aspect ratio now this may seem like a total gimmick but there is this multi aspect ratio here uh, okay if you can see this it's a little lever and you can switch between 3.4, 16.9 and 3.2. And it is super fun. So if you've been following me, <coughs> oh my God, sorry. If you've been following my feed, 
I've been shooting this almost exclusively in 16.9 until very recently, and I'll explain what that switch was. But I've been shooting it in 16.9. The quick menu on the back, this little nub right here, you can, oh, there, see? And then you can see kind of all the functionalities that are kind of the most crucial. So auto white balance, um, you're, you know, if you're in raw, I don't think you see the JPEG settings, but it kind of has your focus modes, all the things that you need, your exposure modes, um, right there at the ready. And I love that, it just makes it fast to shoot. And then you have additional functionality here, like uh, exposure compensation, your timer, your flash, and then if you're ever, even though there is this like weird play and shoot function button here, I don't use that, just hit the bottom button here and you go into auto, oh, sorry. Then you get into review and you can review what you just last shot. You know, I have a bunch of old cameras now and they take all types of weird formats for memory. So everything from smart memory, which is like, I didn't even know existed. It's, it's a, like a small floppy disk kind of a thing that's razor thin. And I had to get a special reader for it, blah, 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 blah. This takes SD cards. It has 24 millimeters on the wide end, like I said. I really love that because for street and for landscapes and for travel, I think you need something that wide. Um, some of the cameras I have do not have, they do start at 35 or whatnot, and I really miss that extra field of view. It also has image stabilization. It's not the best image stabilization, not even for its class or its day, but it is totally, you know, enough to be effective. So I can shoot this down to about a 15th of a second comfortably, and then I get a little sketch from there on out. And then it has built-in memory, which is something I actually wish cameras did today because sometimes you forget your memory card and it's just nice to have a backup plan. So if you do forget your SD card, you have the option to still shoot, um, you know, a limited number of pictures, but you can still shoot and it will capture it on the internal memory. There are also accessories that were made for this camera, not a ton, but some that I really like. So I did buy with this camera this accessory. This is the wide angle adapter. So a couple of things. So if you are interested in doing this, just make sure two things. To put it on, you gotta know that this front ring, similar to like the Ricoh GR, if you're gonna get that wide angle adapter, the front ring comes off and that's how you screw in the adapter. Then the adapter, is in two parts. So you need to make sure if you wanna do this that you're looking for both parts online. I was lucky and found the whole set together at a very reasonable price. Um, but they do get pricey, so just be patient when you're looking. This is the DMWLA4, and that's the tube. And then the actual lens is, should have done that before I did this, okay. This is the DMWLW46. There are similar parts on the market. Make sure you're looking to see that every one of those letters and numbers is the same because there are similar but different ones that don't work on this camera. So you just wanna make sure you're getting the right one. But put this all together and it gives you on the 4-3 aspect ratio a focal length equivalent or a field of view equivalent of 18 millimeters, which is pretty rad. But what's even better is that in 16.9 mode, it gives you the field of view of 16 millimeters. Now the X-Pan with its, what, and when I say the X-Pan, the film Hasselblad X-Pan camera, which is exorbitantly expensive and exorbitantly awesome, is uh, on its widest lens, a 30 millimeter, it has a field of view of 17 millimeters. That is one millimeter difference. That Hasselblad X-Pan format is 16 by six. This is 16 by nine. So what I've done is I have just taped off the top and bottom of my screen, very unscientifically, I might add. And this now becomes my X-Pan camera. So I am shooting this camera that way and it has been so delightful and if you've looked at my feed at the last like few handful of photos what i'm basically doing is i'm then you know visualizing it this way taking it into lightroom and just applying that 16 or yeah the 16 6 crop on it 
And these are my faux X-Pan photos. And I am loving it. It has the hot mount or the hot shoe mount. So you can put on external flashes. It does have a flash. And the flash is actually really decent. And you can also put other things in here. So I actually have a bubble level that's going in here so that particularly for those X-Pan shots, I can kind of keep my level firm because there is no electronic level inside. Huge miss from my perspective. I love an electronic, view, uh, electronic level. I should mention that there's an exhaustive database of all the flashes that work with this camera for TTL functionality and not. Um, I will link out that list in the show notes below. And then the batteries are really easy to find. I don't remember the bottle, the model number, but they're easy to get online. I got a bunch of extras. Um, and you're gonna need them because it doesn't have great battery life. You can set the minimum shutter speed in this camera, which is really key so that you're not going below, for example, the 15th of a second. Uh, it also has auto ISO, which is great, and you can set the parameters of your auto ISO, so how low it goes and how high it goes. I keep it between 80, which is base, and 1600. 1600 is definitely pushing it, <coughs> and uh, I would not shoot that in color, but I don't shoot color on this camera anyway because I do not like the color JPEGs. I love, and I mean love, the black and white JPEGs, specifically the dynamic black and white JPEGs or the smooth black and white JPEGs, but mostly dynamic. And so I'm shooting dynamic black and white on this 99% of the time. If it's a super high contrast, like bright sunlight, dark shadows kind of a day, I will shoot it in smooth. And those two are pretty much my go-tos on this camera. I don't shoot color JPEGs on this, but the closest to good color JPEG setting that I could find is one that I will post in the description below uh, in terms of the recipe, because it's very odd. It's not something I would have expected would work, but it actually does a decent job. It's just not my favorite. So I just shoot raw plus JPEG, and my JPEGs are the dynamic black and white. My raws come out very weird color balanced when I pull it into Lightroom and it happens on both cameras so this must be a thing but they come in looking super green but just auto white balance and it's perfect. It does also have histograms and white clipping um, are features that you can turn on in the menus and that's fantastic because you do want to underexpose this by about a third to make sure you're not losing your highlights. You're way better off recovering your shadows once your highlights are gone in this camera as with many older cameras they're gone. So that's how I'd recommend shooting. Don't love that there's no EVF, but I will say that in the time that I shot this, I really do usually moan about having no EVF on cameras that don't have them. But I was shocked by how like not bothered I was with this camera because I don't think I was using it in any way that would really require an EVF. So this camera to me is a street camera, a landscape camera, a uh, point and shoot day-to-day -day camera. It's not like a portrait camera or a sort of slow, thoughtful, medium format vibe. Um, it's very much a 35 millimeter point and shoot camera to me. And that's how I use it. So it really actually didn't bother me, um, which even surprised myself. So the other thing I don't love about it is even with the raws on the color, the skin tones can be kind of tough sometimes, not all the time, but in certain circumstances, I would say particularly in low light circumstances, anytime you're bumping the ISO um, just you know beyond 200, 400, then the tones become a little bit harder to control. Not terribly shocking given the age and CCD sensor. There is no step zoom in this one. Actually, the LX5, which came after, had a step zoom. So you could step from 24 to 35 to 50 and be consistent with your focal ranges. There's really no way to see what your focal length is as you're zooming on this. It doesn't bother me. I shoot mostly wide, and then when I zoom, I'm not like trying to rinse and repeat necessarily. So not the biggest deal for me, but for you, it might be. So just keep that in mind. Um, Additionally, it's kind of shorter on the long end. It goes to 60 millimeter field of view equivalent. And again, for me, I'm shooting almost exclusively all of my stuff, full frame to medium format to whatever. My focal ranges are almost always 24, 35, and 50. 
Um, so again, kind of perfect for me and it keeps the size down. The LX5 is a little bit bigger, um, but it does go to 90 millimeters. So if you're interested in more reach, that is probably the way to go. My quick shoot mode, and I will put the description for how to set this up in the show notes, but it's fantastic. It's my custom one button. So basically what this does is I turn it on and once I'm in custom one, my screen goes off um, outside of like review for playing, but my screen goes off, the autofocus goes to like this rapid autofocus and it's basically just you trigger and shoot, there's no delay and it's hyper focal distance. So for street, it's perfect. It's like boom, boom, boom. And I just captured three really interesting photos, I'm sure. But that is how I like to shoot it. Um, if I wanna be quick and if I'm on the street. Uh, and then I have C2 mode. So that's the other thing. There are custom modes on here that you can set up. You can set up uh, C1, C21, C22, C23. So you have four custom modes. And then you have like my film within here if you wanna customize your profiles for your dynamic black and white or what have you. So all of those features are great just so you can go back and get the settings that you like the most. Like I put in the title of this YouTube video, like this to me is a mood camera. It's that real point and shoot experience from uh, like say a 35 millimeter Canon auto boy or something like that. It kind of feels a little dirtier. <laughs> it's like a weird way of putting it, but it has texture. It has personality to the files. It's not as clean as say like the Olympus XE1. The Olympus XE1 is definitely a better camera, but this one is more fun. This is like, has grain, it has vibes, it has qualities that uh, it's hard to replicate in a modern camera. So I really think this camera stands out on its own in a very unique way. I've had so much fun shooting it. And so I picked up these two other copies because when I see it going for a reasonable price and not everything is reasonable online, right? So I've seen these up to like $200 and that just seems ludicrous to me. So when I see them cheap, I buy them, and then I put them on my one month too many cameras Instagram channel. So if you're interested in picking one up, you can look there. If it's available, you'll see it. Um, and you can just DM me and pick it up. It's really fun. It's uh, definitely gonna stay in my arsenal of cameras. I know I'm trying to get rid of cameras, but like I feel like there are certain ones that I just, I just wanna hang on to. Um, story of my life. I didn't get into any real tutorials on this camera. It's not really what my channel is for, but there is an exhaustive video playlist from like 2008 when the camera came out online. And so I will link that out down below as well if you wanna get into any given feature on this camera. And there are a lot, I didn't get into 90% of them, I'm sure. But if you wanna go into detailed, uh, you know, tutorial land, that link is down below now our next camera for my trip and for the next two weeks. And that camera is this one. Pentax Q7.